1 Peter 2, 11 to 25. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and temporary residents to abstain from fleshly desires that war against you. Conduct yourselves honourably among the Gentiles so that in a case where they speak against you as those who do evil, they may, by observing your good works, glorify God in the day of visitation. Submit to every human institution because of the Lord, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors as those sent out by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For it is God's will that you, by doing good, silence the ignorance of foolish people. As God's slaves, live as free people, but don't use your freedom as a way to conceal evil. Honour everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, Honour the emperor. Household slaves, submit yourselves to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the cruel. For it brings favour if, because of conscience towards God, someone endures grief from suffering unjustly. For what credit is there if you endure when you sin and are beaten? But when you do good and suffer, if you endure, it brings favour with God. For you were called to this because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you should follow in his steps. He did not commit sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When reviled, he did not revile in return. When suffering, he did not threaten but committed himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that having died to sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounding you have been healed. For you are like sheep going astray, but you've now returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You've got an outline there inside your service sheets, questions up top right. Uh, fairly fulsome passage I said to some friends before the start of the service, so there might be time for questions at the end, but we'll see how we go, uh, see how long the preacher rabbits along. Uh, let me begin with some phrases uh, that we like as Australians. Now, it mightn't be particularly phrased this way, but as Australians, we expect that your words and deeds must match, don't we? Uh, we don't like people who proclaim one thing and practice another. Uh, in our culture, we expect people to put your money where your mouth is. In fact, we like the phrase, what you see is what you get are all different phrases, but all capturing the same idea, which I think most of us would agree with. What we say must be matched by what we do. Uh, even deeper than this, what we do is the substance of what we, show, we say, the, the, the proof, the evidence that it works. And uh, we see it in politics, don't we? Uh, a promise made must be a promise kept. There's no use campaigning on the fact that you'll bring a referendum on The Voice and you don't do it. Anthony Albanese is putting his money where his mouth is, isn't he? He promised it and now he's doing it. Uh, we see it in sport, don't we? Uh, if someone comes to you and says, I play netball, and then you see them playing rugby, well, they're not really a netball player, are they? We expect them to play what they say. Uh, we even see it in how we describe ourselves and affirm our identity. One of the truisms of our age is be true to yourself. Who you say you are must be seen in how you act or behave. Proclamation and practice go hand in hand. So kids, here's the summary. Two P words. Proclamation and practice. And the practice shows the truth of what you're saying, doesn't it? Proclamation and practice go hand in hand. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. <coughs> Thank you that Peter came to understand this truth. Thank you that he learnt what it meant to proclaim and practice being part of your mob. We pray that you'll work the same truth in us today. Not so that we are good people, but so that people meet the good God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, if you remember what we looked at last week as Dan took us through the end of the introduction, uh, we're reminded of our identity as God's people. 
Uh, as we remembered in the kids, saw God's people are scattered all over a part of the world, modern day Turkey, and wherever they are in Turkey under the Roman Emperor, they're God's mob. They're God's mob. They've been given a new identity by God, an identity we learn in chapter 1 that's guaranteed by the resurrection of Jesus. They now call God Father. Their sins have been forgiven. They follow Jesus as Lord. They've been completely transformed from worrying about all sorts of things in this life to knowing where they are going and who they are. They've been saved. And remember back there as we looked at chapter 1, we were reminded that they expressed this in rejoicing. How good is God? In fact, God is so good that they are completely satisfied in their lives. No other group in the world rejoices like that. And that means that they live as a community that is obviously different. They're actually being built as a community. Remember last week, being built into a temple for God? And they have one proclamation. You'll see it there in chapter 2, verse 9. So that you may proclaim the praises of of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. This is who you are. Go and tell the world, look at God. Look at how good God is. Look at how great Jesus is. The rest of this letter is, well, what's the practice that shows that proclamation? What's the everyday practice that shows we believe it and that it works? And that's what Peter's going to turn to now. Look at verse 11. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and temporary residents to abstain from fleshly desires at war against you. Conduct yourselves honourably among the Gentiles so that in a case where they speak against you as those who do evil, they may, by observing your good works, glorify God in a day of visitation. Point two on the outline. The rest of the letter focuses on the practice that shows the proclamation. God is good. Jesus is good. We want you to meet him. That's the proclamation. What's the practice that shows it? And in verses 11 to 12, Peter gives us five really simple principles. Just really simple. Uh, The first is there in verse 11. Remember your identity. Who are you? Aliens and temporary residents. You've got temporary protection visas, don't you? Remember, we've talked about that over the last few weeks. Uh, You are temporary residents in this world. Now, that's a really important phrase because that's how he kicked the letter off in chapter 1, verse 1. He's repeating ideas to remind you your identity is connected to God. Second, the second principle is that's going to make you different. You're going to desire different stuff. Uh, You're going to exist in the world following Jesus and that's going to make you stand out. And notice the way he describes that there. You're going to abstain from fleshly desires, and you're going to live in such a way that proclaims Jesus. You're going to be different. Thirdly, that's going to be really hard. Do you notice the way he phrases that there in verse 11? Uh, it's just going to be a walk in the park, a bed of roses with no thorns. No, it's going to be war. It's going to be war. Uh, You're caught between two competing loyalties, what you were and what you are. And what you were is going to assault you every day. Don't miss out on that home. Interest rates are great at the moment. Don't miss out on that job because if you do, the opportunities are going to disappear. Don't miss out on this. Don't miss out on that. No, no, no. (laughs) You know where you're going, don't you? You've got a new hope a living birth that will never disappear because of the resurrection of Jesus. It will be hard to be different. So they're the first three principles. Remember your identity. Remember your difference. Remember that it's going to be hard. And then he goes on with two more principles to unpack what that will look like generally. And the fourth principle is there in verse 12. Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles. Uh, literally, a be of such behaviour that it is the utmost goodness. The utmost goodness in every part of your life. Now, that will actually set you apart from the world around you. But it will do it in such a way that the world looks at you and goes, actually, 
that's a really good life. That's actually life that is unbelievably good and honourable and respectful. Now, why would you do that? Well, you do that because of your identity. Remember those first three principles. But you also do it because you are proclaiming someone. See it there? Conduct yourselves honourably among the Gentiles so that in a case where they speak against you as those who do evil, they may, by observing your good works, glorify God in a day of visitation. Conduct yourselves with such goodness that people see how amazing God is. How amazing God is. And the context is on that last day when Jesus comes back, people go, actually, that's what all this mob were talking about their whole lives. Look how good God is. Look how amazing he is. Look how wonderful he is. And we knew that because this is how his mob lived. Reflecting the character of God. And now Rome at the time was not a liberal democratic system, was it? Uh, they didn't have regular elections every three to four years. Uh, when you got to 18, it wasn't as if you got a free voice in the political process. Rome ruled the world. Uh, Rome had no opposition. Uh, if there was opposition, Rome crushed it. Under that time, there was one emperor, depending on how you date this letter, it's either Claudius or Nero, and neither of them were pleasant. There's one religion, and that's the emperor is the son of God. Anything that was different stood out and was regarded with suspicion. So God's mob stood out. <laughs> As some people said that God's mob were anti-religion and anti-human because they bowed down to what? Well, they didn't have idols. So they're obviously anti-religion. Uh, others were suspicious of a group within the Roman Empire that said, actually, we follow another boss. His name's Jesus and he's actually alive and rules the universe. Do you see how offensive that would be? Uh, others said, well, those Christians are just plain straight weird because when they get together for meals, they eat the flesh and drink the blood of the boss they follow. And that's what we're actually going to do today with the Lord's Supper, isn't it? And so do you see all these accusations against God's people? They're anti-religion, they're anti-human, they're anti the political system. They have strange and bizarre practices that no one understands. And so in that environment scattered all around modern day Turkey, God's people must conduct themselves in such a way that people actually go, despite their weirdness, despite our suspicion, that is so good. That is so good. Remember verse 3? Just look back at verse 3. You have tasted that the Lord is good. The conduct of God's people, the practice, shows the substance when they proclaim, look how good God is. Look how sufficient Jesus is. Look how enough our Saviour is for us in everyday life. Now, surely that's just plain too hard, isn't it? I mean, isn't the Bible like that sometimes? It just asks you to do too much hard stuff. It's too hard to stand out. That life is just unattainable. You, you expect me to be different in the town that I've lived in for three generations? You expect me to be different in a way that will place me at an unfair and unreasonable disadvantage with the world? You expect me to conduct my life in, in, in such a good way that people will slur my character. Sure, surely it's unattainable. It's not reasonable. It's not fair. For you were called to this, verse 21, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you should follow in his footsteps. Point three on the outline. That's a remarkable statement, isn't it? On one level, it's a reminder of all of the general principles we've just seen. You know, there's five principles. Well, here they are. See the identity called? That's exactly what we were described as in chapter 1, verse 1. 
See the reminder of the difference there that's involved in being part of God's mob? As if you'd have a saviour who suffers. That's just different. And see the hardness there? There will be a tangible cost and suffering. And when Jesus lives like this, he's setting an example for everyone who says they follow him. He's saying, here are my footsteps, just put your feet in them. Literally, the language is, here's the stencil to trace so that you know the shape of life in God's mob. Uh, Jesus practices what he proclaims, doesn't he? He lives an honourable life at the utmost goodness so the people know the goodness of God. Look there in verse 22. He did not commit sin. No deceit was found in his mouth. When reviled, he did not revile in return. When suffering, he did not threaten, but co- committed himself to the one who judges justly. Do you catch how wonderful that life is? How utterly bamboozling it is to the culture around Uh, The focus is on Jesus' trial, but you're meant to understand the trial against the backdrop of his whole life. And at his trial, Jesus was exposed to one of the most corrupt, most self-serving, most abusive uses of power. When Jesus was faced by false accusations, he didn't defend himself or speak an untruth, did he? Uh, When accused of a crime, no one could prove that he'd committed one. He didn't deserve this. He did nothing to warrant his arrest. And when they spat at him, falsely accused him, put a crown of thorns on him, mocked his authority in the universe, what did he do? He did not revile in return. When he was suffering, when he was abandoned by his friends, when he had no place to lay his head, when he was accused of crimes he never committed, when he was beaten and crucified, rejected and humiliated, what did he do? Do you see it there? When suffering, he did not threaten, but committed himself to the one who judges justly. What did Jesus do on the cross? God's good enough. God is good enough. And I entrust myself to him who will end up judging everyone. God's good enough. And when he lived such a profoundly honourable life, and, and just trace it back through his whole life, just go back and see if you can find an unkind word. Just see if you can go and find a time when he rebelled against his parents and said, I know better. Uh, You won't find it because when you look back at his life as he lived at that utmost level of honour and goodness, he was displaying the nature of God. Look at verse 24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that having died to sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounding, you've been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but you have now returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. Humanity is cursed, cursed to end all of our lives in death. And Jesus goes, no, I'm going to take the curse on me. Literally, Deuteronomy 21 says, whoever hangs on a tree is cursed. And Jesus goes, I I committed no sin, but my delight, knowing God is good enough, is to be cursed for you. And when he does that, do you notice all the goodness that flows We might live for righteousness. You're wounded, but you've been healed. You've been lost, but now you are found. You had no one guarding you, and now you have a shepherd and guardian of your souls. Come and meet God. That's what Jesus has done. On the cross, look how good God is. Look how sufficient God is. Look how merciful, loving, and gracious, and generous, and kind God is. Jesus is not just an example. He's actually the means by which we come back to know God and become truly human and part of God's mob. Uh, let me just tell you 
that that is so profoundly against our culture. Uh, how, how would you create a saviour of the world and a people like this? It is anti-practical, it's anti-pragmatic, it's anti-comfort, it's anti-ease. It flies in the face of everything we think is reasonable. And it's profoundly theological. It takes the word of God seriously. It proclaims its goodness and then practices its authenticity. That's what Jesus was about. Have you seen how good God is? He proclaimed it and he practiced it so that everyone who believes it will follow in his footsteps. It's theological in substance and radically different in nature, going out to the world saying, look, our God is good because his son died for us and that is enough. That is enough. And there's no wriggle room with this, is there? There's no wriggle room. This is the practice that shows the substance of the proclamation. Here are the five principles. Here's the example that shows it works. Let's look at what it looks like in two parts of ours, because that's what Peter now does for the rest of the letter. He unpacks it in the various parts of our lives. Uh, he turns to the, uh, an area I like first, politics. Uh, then he turks, turns to households and labour. And Steve next week's got the easy one with talking about marriage with husbands and wives. And then he looks at interpersonal relationships. Uh, in each of those areas, there's already an established way of doing things. And, and then Peter goes, given, given these five principles, given the example we've got, what does that look like here, here, here and here? And so the first area he turns to is politics. Look at verse 13.4 on the outline. <coughs> Submit, to, <coughs> Submit to every human institution because of the Lord, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors as those sent out by him to punish those who do evil, to praise those who do good. For it is God's will that you, by doing good, silence the ignorance of foolish people. As God's slaves, live as free people, but don't use your freedom as a way to conceal evil. Honour everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honour the emperor. The command's clear, isn't it? Uh, it's actually the same command in all of these areas, submit. Submit. Uh, notice it there in verse 13, submit to, to who? Every human institution. Every political structure from the supreme authority of the emperor to the local provincial governor or the mayor. That's your honourable conduct. And it's established in your identity. See that principle we talked about before? Why, why do we do that? Because of the Lord. Because you're connected to Jesus. Uh, here's how it looks. Because God's mob have the highest boss, he'll return in all glory to judge the universe, because God's mob know how good that boss is, look, he laid down his life for his enemies, then God's mob go, yep, yeah, we can submit, no worries. We can submit to every human authority. That's going to stand out in the world around us, isn't it? It'll mark God's mob as different. It's not going to be easy. Our world is constantly clamouring to us about our rights and what we deserve, isn't it? And God's mob are not clamouring about that. Uh, it'll be a display to the world around us that we trust that God is good enough, that there is a king who rules everything, and we trust his leadership. Just how did Jesus deal with political authorities that were corrupt, evil, and violent? How did Jesus deal with political authorities that demanded the taxes? How did Jesus deal with a political authority that said, you have no rights except Rome? Uh, Peter's aware that the role this plays is to silence the accusations against God's mob. Remember those accusations? You follow another boss. You guys are anti-human. You guys hate religion. You guys are just strange. And yet within Rome, that casts all these suspicions on them. The Christians go, no, we'll follow the laws. 
because we follow Jesus. Now, Peter's also aware of how we might use that because he knows our hearts. He knows how we might use because of the Lord. And you see it down there in verse 16? A God's mob might be tempted to say, well, no, actually, I follow a higher political authority. So this political authority has no right to tell me what to do. No, no, that's not what Peter says Jesus is about. Peter actually exposes that way of thinking. How does he describe it there in verse 16? He describes that way of thinking as evil. How did Jesus respond? There's your template. Now, Peter also understands that this will provide tension and temptation. We might actually be tempted and caused fear by all the things being thrown at us. And he wants us to get straight that we have nothing to fear at all. Look at verse 17, really neat summary. Honour everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honour the emperor. Do you see what he does there? How do you deal with the world out there? Honour them. Live such good lives that people will see the character of God and his goodness. Or what do you do with the people in here? Love the brotherhood. Who do you fear? You only fear God. You only fear God. Now, what might such a practice look like here in Narrabri? Let me just give you a couple of brief thoughts before we finish with workplace relations. First, always look at the template. (laughs) Get so familiar with Jesus, you know the stencil. What would Jesus have done? Now, I don't always like that phrase, but it's helpful at this point. How did Jesus deal with the political authorities? How did he deal with corruption? How did he deal with misused power? What was his focus and concern? How did Jesus talk of his rights as they nailed him to the cross? Secondly, submission doesn't mean compromise. We do serve God. There will be some lines to be drawn, but are they the lines drawn by God? Is that the thing God wants us to get upset about? Is that the thing that took Jesus' attention? And once we've drawn those lines, are we willing to submit to what the political authorities will bring? Because that's what submission is. Submission as honourable conduct covers all of our actions, all of our words and all of our online posts. How do we disagree honourably with others on the political spectrum? Do we attribute motives and character flaws where none have been expressed? How do we describe people and policies? How do we fairly and respectfully assess them? Does our honourable conduct in the area of politics reflect the same grace we've experienced in Jesus? Finally, there are lots of opportunities for us to express this, aren't there? I just think in, in the next few months we're going to have a referendum, aren't we? On the voice. Here's an opportunity for us to express honourable conduct that shows the substance of our proclamation. What might it look like? Well, and let's turn to the last one and let's deal with this one fairly quickly. Verse 18.5 on the outline. Household slaves, submit yourselves to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the cruel. For it brings favour if, because of conscience toward God, someone endures grief from suffering unjustly. For what credit is there if you endure when you sin and are beaten? But when you do good and suffer, if you endure it, it brings favour with God. Again, notice the very clear command. Submit to which master? Your master, with all respect, whether they're good or cruel. With all respect. Now, slavery in the Roman Empire is different to slavery as we think in terms of America or tobacco. Slavery in the Roman Empire, well, up to 60% of the workforce were slaves. Covered everything from university lecturers right through to household labour. Uh, It's a much different kettle of fish to the one we're used to, but in this environment, notice again the principles, because of a conscience towards God, because of your identity, Submit to every master because you know God is good and you trust him. That will not be easy. 
but it will be noticeably different. In fact, your conduct will show the substance of the grace you've already experienced. If your wages are docked because you did something wrong, you deserved it. If your wages are docked because you honour Jesus, be patient and endure it. Just like Jesus did when he was brought something unjust himself. Why? Because we know God is good enough. Now, in our environment, there's no slavery. This passage would be preached very differently in other parts of the world today, wouldn't it? But in our environment, this principle is clear. God is good. Jesus is enough. So I can endure this. God is good. Jesus is enough. So I can endure this. The practice shows the substance of the proclamation. Let me pray. Father, we have covered a huge amount today. Uh, Father, I thank you for your goodness to us. I thank you that we've tasted you and seen in an empty tomb our resurrected Lord that you have our best interests at heart, our deepest interests. Father, help us to proclaim that goodness and then practice it in the most honourable conduct in every part of our lives. Not so that we're known as good people, but so that we're known as God's people. Our Father, in this we pray that our desire will be for your reputation so that people will see in our proclamation and practice how grand you are and others will come to know that goodness themselves. In Jesus' name, amen.